me. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, all right. I do have a couple of disclaimers, some acknowledgments to Byrad and to Dr. Talm Alexander. Some of you may know he's at Summa Health System. They both allowed me to borrow a couple of their slides and use them in my presentation. Okay, objectives. To go through a little bit the evolution of ANA testing and its applicability to clinical diagnosis, to understand theory and principles of multiplex testing, and then the advantages and challenges of implementing this in a clinical laboratory. Okay, so why, um, why ANA testing? Well, ANA tests are one very important part of a larger group of disorders called autoimmune disease, and they are very interesting with some very interesting characteristics. There we go. First of all, they're chronic inflammation without any focus of infection that we can find. There's a female predominance. There's a genetic component which seems to be a predisposition, and that even has geographic and ethnic um, characteristics to it. But even if you have the gen genetic component, you need some kind of environmental component, a trigger of some sort to be able to manifest the disease. They can be organ specific, like thyroid, liver, diabetes is another one of the ones. Okay, they can be systemic, and this will be the ones we're concentrating on today. And you can have clustering of diseases. One individual can have more than one autoimmune disease. Or in families, one person can have one disease, and another person can have another one of the autoimmune diseases. They are responsive to immunosuppression. Obviously, it's the immune system reacting against self. So if you can suppress that, you can suppress the reactions. And for our purposes, they have autoantibodies, which we can use to our advantage. The ones that we're going to concentrate on today, the systemic rheumatic diseases, are also a very interesting sort of thing. They can affect multiple organ systems. You can have signs in the brain, you can have signs in the liver, you can have signs in the peripheral blood. It really can be very devastating. But all these signs and symptoms throughout the different diseases are very, very similar. Fever, malaise, maybe a rash, maybe some joint pain. So they are problematic diagnostics problems for um, the rheumatologist and for the um, internist. So the laboratory data is really critical for the diagnosis. Some of the examples of these diseases I'm sure you're probably all familiar with, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, Sjogren's, polymyositis or dermatomyositis, mixed connective tissue disease, which is really one of the ones that mimics the others very much, and even drug-induced lupus. Just out of curiosity, how many people here do ANA testing in their lab? Okay, quite a few, that's good. But how many of you remember the very, oh, excuse me, one more thing. Um, they can have diagnostic relevance. They can be important in the diagnosis of the disorder. They can have pathologic importance. In other words, they can really be uh, what the cause of the, of the symptoms. This one is important, it can be predictive, they can precede the onset of disease by several years. And I think Dr. Peel might have mentioned that in diabetes, that can also be uh, important. And also they can be prognostic because they can sometimes predict the clinical course of the disease or maybe a specific subgroup that might have more or less symptoms than some of the others. But there are issues in these autoantibodies before you think they're the end all and be all. They can be in healthy individuals. In some studies, and I'll show you some of these later on, as many as 25% of healthy people can have an autoantibody, uh, especially an ANA. And there are multiple detection methodologies like there have been for many of the things that we've been talking about today. They may have differing sensitivities and specificities, and method-to-method -method results may not be comparable. Okay. Now, how many people remember doing, besides myself, the original, okay, come on, I know we're older, so we can do it. The original ANA test called the LE cell or lupus, lupus erythematosus test. It um, started in Mayo Clinic when they were looking at bone marrows for various reasons, and they began to see that in groups of people that had what was diagnosed as lupus, they found a very peculiar cell in their bone marrow. And they found through lots of studies that this cell was related to a factor in patient plasma, which at that time they didn't even know was antibody. 
Um, the test then evolved into doing it on peripheral blood, and, and the people have done it. I just wanted to, uh, if you haven't, you took a clot tube and you damaged the cells to create the nuclear material with applicator sticks. You went like this, up and down in the tube. Then you incubated them, and the damaged nuclei would be phagocytized by the antibody if the patient had it, and then you could look at the slide and see the LE cell. Now, this was obviously labor intensive. Sensitivity was about 50%, specificity was about 50%. Uh, but it was the only game in town for a very long time. The next sort of highlight in doing ANA testing was the indirect immunofluorescence test, and I think we're probably all very familiar um, with doing that test. Um, basically, you know, you have a substrate, you put the patient serum, if there's antibody, it binds, and you put your detector system and put your um, fluorescence on there and look at it under a microscope. This was in the late 60s, maybe a little bit earlier than that. At the time that this first came out, they used an animal substrate, rat or mouse, liver or kidney. Of course, now that's been replaced by HEP2 and sometimes the HEP2000. Again, it was fairly labor intensive. Again, that's no longer true because now there are many automated um, procedures that can, or instruments that can actually automate the whole thing, do the staining, the washing, and everything for you. And in addition, there now are digital microscopes that will actually try to read and project a pattern so you don't have to sit there and go like this. There was improved sensitivity and specificity, but you still needed quite a bit of technical expertise to read these slides. And the reason was you saw fluorescence everywhere in the cell, some in the nucleus, some in the cytoplasm. This is a composite. I actually kind of like this slide. But if you look at it, there's three panels across this way and four down this way. So those of you who do ANA testing, you can um, pick some of these out. But um, if you haven't done it before, you could see how it would be kind of difficult. But when they looked at all these patterns, what they found was that certain patterns seemed to be correlated with certain diseases. There was a rim homogeneous pattern where the rim of the nucleus was fluorescent. You could find speckles all over the place. They could be big, they could be small, they could be fine granular. All of these different types of, of names have been applied. The nucleolus could fluoresce. In dividing cells, you could see centromere. You could even see cytoplasmic staining, and the ribosomes might be stained. So they correlated these sort of with disease, but you can see how much overlap there is. So you couldn't say speckled pattern is SLE for sure, because it could be several other things, or you couldn't say SLE is always going to give you a rim pattern, because it may not. So what they did then, again, we're talking years of work. This is the same chart as before, but I've inserted in the center what they think was the antigen target for some of these things. So the rim homogeneous most likely was chromatin or double-stranded DNA. The speckled pattern could be what they now call SM, which, believe it or not, was named for Mr. Smith, who was the first person in whom they found this. So it has no other bearing than that. Uh, but you could also have RNP, ribonucleoprotein, SSA, SSB, the nuclear was more or less what they call it, SCL70. Centromere was centromere. Cytoplasma speckled in the cytoplasm was actually JO1. And then ribosomal staining, ribosomal P. And you could see that with lupus in particular with CNS symptoms. Now, we know more today, too, uh, exactly what some of these things are. Um, the uh, JO1 is a histidyl transferase, and SCL70 is a DNA topoisomerase. So we do know, you know a lot more about what these are, but we still call them the names that we're familiar with. The next thing then, which took advantage of having these pure antigens, <clears throat> was the ELISA methodology. And Dr. Um, I think was it Dr. Uh, Pandori went through these this morning, so I won't have to go through that. But this was in the 1970s, and it was automated. So that took away, at that time, one of the problems with doing so many manual immunofluorescent tests. It did have good sensitivity and specificity. You could now test individually for multiple different ANA antigens, but you needed a separate test for each one of the antigens. 
And I want to return for just a moment to antigen selection because that is crucial and key in interpreting ANA tests. Every manufacturer has their own way of getting their antigens. They're going to have different ways. They're going to probably be proprietary, so you know they don't want anybody else to, to know how they're getting things going. And they're going to give you different results. So you can take a whole cell extract. You could do a purified antigen. You can do recombinants, and some of them are even synthetic. The issue is this, if you do a whole cell extract, you're really doing like an ANA screen because there's so many specificities in there, you're just not sure. You know you have a positive and that's about all. You also have to make sure if you're trying to do a specific cellular component that it's a really pure preparation. And you have to verify the identity of the preparation by um, usually sharing it with other people and getting them to agree, yes, this is the specificity that it is. And one problem with any of these tests is that conformational antigens may be lost when you fix them to some type of um, solid phase slide. So we had ELISA for a while, and now finally, <clears throat> what we have available is multiplex technology. And I think some of you are already using it. We've been using it since January of this year, just about 10 months. It's a bead-based technology, eight micron beads, and it really combines several different uh, methodologies in one. It's flow-based because you analyze these individual beads as they pass single file through the detectors. You have fluorescent technology because you can identify the beads with the dyes that they have and then also identify with another fluorescent um, detector whether it's positive or not for that particular antibody and then the traditional antigen antibody biochemistry. So you identify the beads by the dye content. You label a specific bead with a different antigen. You mix them together with the patient's serum, and then you detect the bead first, and then whether it's positive or negative. So these slides are complement of um, uh, the uh, BioRad people. So here are 25 color-coded beads, eight micron spheres, with the fluorochrome this way and another one this way. So you can see uh, this one in particular has some high level of this one, but really a low level of this one over here. And this one up here, this bead has the highest of both of them. So you can identify which bead is which, and then you put the antigen on it. So this shows how you, you can pick you know, any and one you want, but each bead is co coded with a unique antigen. So in this particular example, Bead one is double-stranded DNA. Bead three is ribosomal P. Um, bead five, or is there bead five, is SSA. So you've got all of the different things in there. And what you can do is mix them all together. It doesn't matter because you can identify the bead anyway. So you can have a single bead reagent for multiple specificities. And then this is sort of how the sample is processed. You put the beads in, you add the patient serum, you wait and incubate. And this, I think, is one of the interesting things. The beads have a magnetic core. So when you're going to wash, they turn the magnet on, and it holds the beads out of the way while the wash is done. Then you can add your um, indicator system, your conjugate, incubate again, wash again. And then you have the beads suspended in solution, and you put them to, through the two. So this shows the, that you, first of all, aspirate the beads into the probe. Then you run them through the flow cell. And each bead is subjected to two lasers. One identifies the bead. It's a 635 nanometer laser. The next one, then, identifies if the antigen is present or not with the phycoerythrin reporter dye. Now, this one shows not ANAs, measles, mumps, varicella, rubella, but you know it doesn't matter what it was. These can also be done on the um, Bioplex. And this is my own slide that I put together to try to help me understand what is going on here. So RFI is relative fluorescence intensity. So the very first bead that goes through the instrument, let's say it's identified as double-stranded DNA. So you've got one of these counted. And the count is high, so the patient must have had antibody to that. Okay. Let's say the second bead is also double-stranded DNA. So now you've got two of those with a number that's extremely close to the first one. So the next one is JO1, so you've got one JO1 bead, very, very low um, 
number, so that's gonna be negative to that. And you keep going through that way. Let's see, here's another double-stranded DNA, so you've got three of those and another one down here. And notice how close all of those numbers um, are. The um, principle of the instrument is that you have to have 150 events for each antigen before that particular sample is considered complete. Okay, so advantages again, um, simultaneous detection of multiple analytes, a single tube with minimal sample volume, fully automated random excess, decreased turnaround time, definitely in increased workflow efficiency. And I didn't mention this, but these are also counted in there. Enhanced quality assurance in each tube, because each tube contains a serum verification bead, which confirms that the sample was added. Each tube contains an in internal standard bead, which standardizes the performance of the detector. And each tube contains a reagent blank bead, which detects nonspecific binding. So you don't have to try to do one control and, and see if there's nonspecific binding. You see it in every patient sample, whether it's there or not. And again, since we're all laboratorians, just these are now characteristics specifically of Bioplex, and that's what I'll be talking about because that's what I have my experience with. So they detect antibodies to all the things that we've been talking about. Double-stranded DNA, SM, there is an SM-RNP combo, then there's RNP with two components, SSA with two components, SSB, centromere, SCL70, JO1, chromatome, and ribosomal P. So the first um, piece of information you get out of the system is whether anything in there is positive. So if one or more of these antibodies is present, you're gonna get a positive screen, so to speak. They set it up so you detect high avidity IgG antibodies only. With IFA, depending on what your um, conjugate is, you can detect both IgG and IgM. It's set up to detect clinically relevant antibodies with the best known disease associations. There's no equivocal result, it's either yes or no, except double-stranded DNA because that is a quantitative test, so there is an indeterminate with that. And all of the results that you have are accessible for 30 days in the database, and I'll mention that again in a minute. So again, just so you see the numbers that you might be talking about, for double-stranded DNA, linear range is one to 300 international units per mil. For the rest of these, which are qualitative, it's 0.2 to 8.0 antibody index. The negative is less than four international units. Less than one is negative for this. Indeterminate is the range here that's not applicable there. Positive is greater than 10 international units and here positive is greater than or equal to one antibody index. When I made the decision to try to do this, I wanted to give you just a little bit of information about our hospital system so that you'd know why I felt this was something that should be um, implemented in our system and why it would be good. So Norton Healthcare is in Louisville, Kentucky. We have five freestanding hospitals, I have over 12,000 employees. There's four adult full service hospitals and there is the only freestanding children's hospital in the state of Kentucky. The system also owns multiple physician practices. They own many more than this, but I sort of put ones that I thought might be ordering ANA testing, internal medicine, pediatrics, rheumatology, et cetera. We have significant laboratory outreach in addition to all of this up here and the immunology testing as well as the microbiology testing are all performed downtown at a central lab. We had last, or last year about 8,500 ANA screens. I mean, if, if you work at Quest or any of those, that's nothing, but for us, that's quite a bit. And we have a fairly high positivity rate. I don't know why, but we do, 20 to 25 percent. It seems high to me anyway. And we had been at this point in time, we're using an ELISA screen with also doing IFA titer and pattern on positives. Okay. So um, when I decided to try to look at this, I said, well, what have other people found by using the Bioplex? What, what's in the literature about comparing Bioplex to what we're currently doing? So th there was really quite a bit, actually. This is just a couple of composites from a couple of the articles that I found. This one was in the Journal of Immunologic Methods in 2010, and they compared Bioplex 
the EIA from ANOVA, and Microgen, which is a line immunoassay. It's a little bit like a Western blot. These, these studies were done in Europe. Okay, so if you compared Bioplex to EIA, the agreement was just overall agreement, not anything specific antigens, antibodies, whatever, was 83%. If you look to the line immunoassay, 82%, and EIA to LIA was 79%. So that's fairly typical for comparing one manufacturer to another for anti-nuclear antibody testing. <clears throat> This one right here was Bioplex to EIA um, Pharmacia, and that was 79% agreement. This was in the Journal of Rheumatology in 2007. So we see somewhere around 80% is the agreement that you're getting. This one I thought was very interesting, and it comes back to some of the points we talked about in the very first slide with genetic predispositions, et cetera. This group had, I think, almost 1,000 patients. They looked at patients who were carrying a diagnosis of lupus. They looked at their unaffected relatives, and they looked at healthy controls, quote, unquote. And here's the results of the Bioplex percent positive, and here's IFA percent positive. But in addition, they broke these three groups of patients into subgroups, African American, Hispanic, and European American. So you can look at those pretty quickly, I guess, and see mostly, again, around an 80% or so positivity with Bioplex, a little bit higher for IFA, which is not at all unexpected. Lower percentage in Hispanics, and even lower in European Americans. Then you go to unaffected relatives. These are people that are related, but supposedly don't have an autoimmune disease or one of the systemic rheumatic diseases. In the African American group, 30 to 37 percent of these people had a positive antibody by two different methods. Hispanics, it was a little bit less, and European Americans, a little bit less than that. And then healthy controls, and I put that in quotes before, 20 percent, somewhere, this is the lowest, 10 percent, but up to 20 percent of these people were positive in the ANA by both of these two methods. Now, that either talks about some false positives or maybe some of the people in this group were in the group I talked about earlier where they have a presence of the autoantibody years before they even have the disease. Now, in order to answer that question, you would need longitudinal studies, which I don't think have been done. But, um, you know, I think that's interesting from just the, uh, the standpoint of how these diseases work, but it's interesting from our standpoint because we've got to keep this in our mind when we interpret results from patients. Okay, so um, I was able to arrange to get a Bioplex in my lab, and I thought, oh my gosh, what do I do now? What, what's involved in making this transition? So this slide encompasses many months of thinking and work about what we need to do. Now, again, we're all laboratorians, so you know you have to do validation and correlation studies, okay? But I was gonna switch from EIA to multiplex. Now, the Diametics, which is the one we were using, did have a HEP2 extract and it was spiked with other antigens such as SSA. Bioplex didn't have the HEP2, so you know, how would that affect what kind of results we got? One positive thing is that I could bring in-house the ANA-specific tests that we were currently sending out, because we were just doing a screen, and if it was positive, we did do IFA and titer, but all the rest of the stuff we didn't do anything with. Um, how would we handle this for all of the different specificities? Should we report and charge the patient, and we would also pay, for all 11 specificities with any ANA order? Uh, we have 20 to 25% positive, but that means we have 75 to 80% negative. So all of those patients would be paying for 11 different tests, or maybe 12 if you include the screen, and they didn't need it. That didn't seem right to me. Um, should I just report the screen result and wait for the physician to order individual antigens? Well, that was one way to do it. Uh, and again, remember the data was there for 30 days afterwards, so we could go back and find that patient, and if the physician wanted to know what specific ones were there, we could just release that data, and we wouldn't have to rerun the sample or get the patient back in to be redrawn. So that was an advantage if we decided to do it that way. 
Well, what if we decided to reflex the positive screen? Should we reflex it to all 11 antigens and the patient was maybe only positive to one? Again, I wasn't sure about that. Or could we release them in a sort of a tier system? Pick some of the most common first of all and call that tier one and then pick some of the other ones and call that tier two. So um, the other thing too is if we were gonna do any kind of reflex testing, we had to have medical staff approval. And if you remember, I said we had five hospitals, so each one has a medical staff, and then there's a system medical staff executive committee. That's the one that had to approve any kind of reflex testing so that we could use it at all of the different hospitals. And the medical staff had to be educated because, as somebody said earlier, I think, yeah, Belinda with the RPR test, uh, you know, I've been ordering ANAs for 50 years, and I still want to order an ANA IFA. So we had to teach them about ordering. We had to see new expected ranges. There would be new interpretive guidelines. And some people don't think about this till you get ready to go online. There are tons of computer changes that have to go on, not only in our LIS system, but in our HIS system. And to top it off, the outreach that we have, which is the for-profit arm of our corporation, they have a third LIS system. So we had three systems to try to interface so that the results could go out and we didn't have to manually send everything. So it was, you know, oh my goodness, how am I going to work this out? Well, I did it sort of in two different ways, and I'll talk about those separately. Um, the first way was what I called the technical, procedural kind of thing, doing all the validations, the correlations, et cetera. Then the second one was more of the process. What am I gonna decide to do about all of these questions in here? So, first of all, validation and correlation, you all know this really, really well, but this is how we got our patient samples. We saved known patient samples. The CDC has a known positive ANA panel, of, I think 10 different um, antibodies. From ARUP, which is our reference lab, we ordered samples with unusual patterns because, again, you know from the CAP, you have to have 20 positives and 20 negatives. So getting 20 positive Joe 1 in our experience is, not, you know, would take us till uh, probably the turn of the next century to get that many. Um, and then we had to enlist the cooperation of the rheumatologist. So the rheumatologist, both pediatric and adult, I talked to them one-on-one -on -one, um, saying I was thinking about doing this, I was gonna present the data, I would share the results of their patient, tell them the reason for the change, what the implications might be, and they were all fairly receptive to, to doing it at that point. Okay, now, just again, gross data across the top. This is what we did looking at IFA, and we were using one to 80 on this particular thing, okay? Um, Bioplex compared to IFA, which was the BioRed IFA, with HEP2 slides, 73% agreement with all, the, if, with all the samples that we looked at. Bioplex to EIA, and that was the one we had been using, was 77%. IFA to EIA, which is what our current system was, was the same, 77%. We also wanted to look at the specific analytes and see what, um, you know, what that looked like. So this is the analyte over here. Here's IFA Bioplex and the percent agreement. So double-stranded DNA, when you put both positives and negative from this and positive and negative from this, 70% basically agreement. The rest of them look really pretty good. There were a couple in here where there was 100% agreement between the IFA and the Bioplex. Um, this one is explainable because the um, Bioplex has really been standardized to the original FAR assay, which is the radioimmunoassay for doing DNA. And these results came from the Crithidia, which is an immunofluorescent test where the kinetoplast of that organism, which has a lot of DNA, would fluoresce. So the, on purpose, I was told, this Bioplex was standardized to the original FAR assay, which many people still believe is the gold standard for trying to look for renal involvement. Um, I also mentioned that the um, CDC put out a panel. So we looked at that, and these are the results of that. So this first sample, they said, gave a, a homogeneous rim. They said it was double-stranded DNA. We got double-stranded DNA, plus also chromatin. The next one was speckled. They said that was SSB. We got both SSA and SSB. This one was also speckled, 
with, you can see what it was here, we picked up one, two, three, four, five, six different antibodies in that particular sample. And, and that's sort of the point I want to make. Uh, these at the bottom were all very good, except we did pick up an extra one here, is that when you look at the Bioplex and look at all the results, we were looking at anything that was positive on the Bioplex result, Bioplex picks up a lot more different antibodies than what simply you can do with the immunofluorescent technique. So at this point, you know right here, you have a speckled pattern. If, if this was an unknown patient, you wouldn't know what you'd be working with. You could, you know, uh, there's probably, what, more than 60 specificities and 29 or 30 different patterns that have been seen. So you wouldn't know, but we do. We know right here exactly what it was. There has been some talk that none of the automated systems um, pick up nuclear very well, okay? So we didn't do simply just this group of nuclear, but I did want to see, can we pick up any at all? So we used ones that were called by IFA nuclear and ran it against our EIA and our Bioplex. So this was negative by EIA, which is the one we had been using. Bioplex picked up SSA. This one was negative by both, but then all the rest of them were picked up on both methods. But again, here you just know it's positive. Here you know exactly what antibody you're dealing with. So those, most of those patients would have been picked up and further followed because they did have and would have had a positive um, result. Okay, now I can go into the process part. How am I gonna handle this? I decided to call this an A and A cascade and I set up this algorithm. Now, the, I think it's the American Rheumatism Association says you're really not supposed to call it an ANA screen unless you're doing IFA and can detect everything. That's their current position, okay? Um, so we called it an ANA cascade. And if the ANA cascade was negative, we simply reported it. And of course, obviously, the system medical exec executive committee gave us approval to automatically reflex anything that was positive. If it was positive, I said we would add tier one, and I'll tell you in a minute what I chose for that. So if it's tier one is positive, you report the antibodies there that are contained in, in tier one and which ones were positive, and you stop. If tier one is negative, you add tier two and report whatever antibodies are there. And you know because you've had a positive screen that one antibody somewhere has to be positive. We did one other thing, and I'm hoping that someday that we can um, stop doing that, but we are right now. So this is the same slide, except when we get a positive, we're still doing an A and A IFA with titer. Uh, and when we were first of all doing um, any sample, whether it was positive or negative, by all three methods, we found that sometimes when the Bioplex was negative and the EIA was negative, the IFA was positive, but it was one to 80, no specific pattern, you know, really not much help in, in doing anything, so. Okay, here's what I put in tier one, and this was a lot of thinking and talking to a lot of people and a lot of research that this group of antibodies here are probably the ones that have, that you see most frequently. And we decided those were the ones that would go in the tier one pattern. Interpretation guideline, this goes along with every report that goes out. So mostly with this percentage, which is a compilation from the literature, this says you might have SLE. But you also could have lupus nephritis, and you need to be aware of that. Um, I think Belinda was, or, or Dr. Yen Lieberman was also saying, we in the laboratory need to get out a lot more and uh, let the clinicians know what we can do for them and what we can't do for them so that they then can take that information and interpret along with everything else. Um, so these are the ones we have. You may have noticed um, previously in one of the slides that uh, the RNP and the SSA have two different components in them. That was one on one of the previous slides. In Europe, they, uh, the Bioplex separates those components out, and there's some evidence that they seem to have different disease associations or at least maybe some symptom associations, but that was not possible here. So this is, these are a composite 
this one is a composite, and, and then, um, excuse me, so is this one. So again, most of the time what the clinical association was, and then some additional things that they might do. This is interesting, I think, right here. If you have both of these, then the literature seems to show it's a high probability of SLE, which, again, there's some evidence that shows that if a person has more than one anti-nuclear antibody, their chance of having a systemic rheumatic disease is much higher than if they just have one. So now here we have the tier two, and these were the ones centromere, chromatin, JO1, and ribosomal P. Um, this disclaimer or um, caveat was put on all of the um, slides that this was for information only, that other tests and clinical data have to be used in making medical decisions. And that was something that we thought was a, uh, something that we needed to do. We wanted to give information, but we didn't, couldn't say, if you have this antibody, you're gonna have this disease, because it still doesn't work quite that, um, quite that way. Okay, so we um, started in January of this past year doing the ANA cascade just as a, like a screen only and not reporting any of the individual titers because we also went live with several other things at that point. So in May of this year is when we started releasing the information on the um, particular antibody. So issues go live. So we again had, we didn't want really ANA screen on there anywhere in the computer selectable. So we substituted it with new ANA cascade, and um, if they selected the cascade, that you know it's what they got. And if they tried to find ANA screen, they they couldn't very well. Okay, but we also had to have the individual antibodies orderable separately, because sometimes that's all they want. They know what the patient's been positive for, and they just want to monitor that particular one. Well, one of the first things we found out was they would get what I was calling duplicate orders. They would order an ANA cascade, plus they'd order SSA, SSB, or maybe cascade plus double-stranded. Well, we knew, because we'd been living with it for months, that those antibodies w would be detected in the screen. But even though I sent out to all the medical staff members of all five hospitals a blast fax telling them about the change and what this meant, it didn't sink into them, but you know, that's, they don't live with it every day, so that really uh, isn't their fault. So we added, after about the first week or two, this comment to a negative ANA. We said, patient serum is negative for antibodies too, and I listed all those 11 or 12 antigens. So that has helped a lot. We don't get so many duplicate orders anymore. And then again, when, when they did get the duplicate order, we canceled that order as a duplicate with another comment that said, antibody included in ANA cascade. So we still get occasional ones, maybe from new clients or something, but that has really helped a lot take care of, of what we call duplicate orders. We have had some discordant results, but you know, we're going to. That's not a problem. Um, the cascade is negative and the clinician would call and say, I'd still like to have an IFA titer, so we would do it. In one case, it was a 1 to 320 rim pattern that the patient supposedly had double-stranded DNA in the past. Um, and, you know, but again, some of those, we're not going to pick up all of them. And then there were more computer issues. To my mind, it makes sense. If you have an ANA cascade you know, up here and you send it to tier one titer, that that result should be right under the ANA cascade. And that's what it looked like when we did mock computer things. But when it came out, the um, EPIC system puts results in, in the order in which they were ordered. So the ANA cascade is ordered first and then we have to get it and have to do it. And in the meantime, they've ordered a CBC and a complete metabolic panel. And then finally, we release and order the reflex test. So it was separated on the computer screen. So, you know, you just don't think about those things, but you have to do something with them, I think. So, and then I guess in summary, it was really a relatively smooth transition. We've had no major complaints, a couple of calls about explaining something, so I think that was good. Um, we have improved the service because the, on positive cascades, the results are reported like, bam, you know, oh, here's a positive, 
we go in and you can set the instrument up. It goes in and releases tier one. And if that's negative, then we go and hit another button and it releases tier two and if it's interfaced and they're there. The clinicians love that. We have improved diagnostic specificity, I think, also. Um, we have had a couple of clinicians tell us that they, they thought their patient might have lupus, but they did the screen, it was positive, and they found that they had um, one of the others, like maybe an SSA, SSB combination, which with everything else would more likely fit with Sjogren's syndrome. So I think that the multiplex technology offers many advantages. Oops. Oh, and the choice of method has to be determined by your patient population and what's important in your laboratory. Um, communication between clinicians and laboratories is absolutely critical in trying to put this together. And this is something that I think we need to realize and the clinicians need to realize. If they have a patient who has a negative result by any of the ANA techniques and they still have a very high clinical suspicion then they need to call you and we probably need to try to do one of the other specificities to see if it's one of those patients that just doesn't match in the different techniques. Also, the presence of multiple antibodies is, as I said, highly specific for systemic rheumatic diseases. And you know that right away with the multiplex technology. You have a positive screen and you know there's four different antibodies that are present there. And the clinician then knows that information also immediately. I haven't mentioned anything about this. It's just a little bit to think about. Um, autoantibody profiles may be important in personalized medicine. I believe Dr. Peel was talking about that. And so if certain antibody combinations would lead to saying, oh, well, this patient most likely has such and such, then you, that would be more personalized than just saying, oh, they have a positive uh, ANA, we're going to treat them with steroids, you know. So this is in the future because we need a lot more studies, but I think that is a possibility. And I think, like with most lab tests, we're still waiting for the 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity tests to come along. So um, that's it. Thank you, and I'll be glad to take any questions.